This is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. In this week's episode, we'll look at political choices that can be viewed as controversial. Minority voters have agreed on one thing since the days of FDR. In presidential elections, they vote for Democrats. But what about those who turn against that tide? What are they hoping for and how do they get there? Harvard University Kennedy School of Government professor Leah wright Rigor explores the African-American community's approach in The Loneliness of the Black Republican, Pragmatic Politics, and the Pursuit of Power. And then, one of the major political choices we make is about the question of choice. But The Nation columnist Katha Pollitt has some words for those who think they're advocates for choice in pro-reclaiming abortion rights. But first, here's my interview with Leah wright Rigor. So, The Loneliness of the Black Republican, this is a memoir? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> not exactly, not yeah. exactly. Um, I am not a Republican, um, so going into this, I had, I had no agenda, but I was really interested in the stories of Republicans and the Republican Party, and since I didn't know too much about it, I thought I'd, I'd do some exploring and, and found a lot of interesting stories. And you explore the, this, the period of, of what it meant to be a black Republican in the mid-20th century, which which a lot of people can empathize with the idea that, hey, it made sense to be a Republican in the, in the 1920s, and the 1930s, uh, just f going from that party of Lincoln legacy. But what you're exploring is really how, what happens when that legacy wears off and we're actually dealing with 50, 50 60, 70 years later, you know, real politics and real political questions. So what, is the, what are the changes that happen once the party, once the Republican Party starts moving in a different direction, what happens to African Americans? So what happens to those, to that loyal constituency that, that were always uh, Republican? And how do those changes happen? So really my book does explore this 50 year history, um, how these changes happen, what they look like, and what are the implications for politics and policy? The Democrats were really the racist party of the time, to the degree that there were people that there were elected officials openly advocating explicitly segregationist and, and racist uh, policies. It was Democrats in the South, right? Right, so Southern Democrats um, play a huge role here. And I think what's important to note is that um, when Southern Democrats break off from the party, Dixiecrat party, big year 1948, uh, it's also an opportunity for a president like Truman to desegregate the armed forces and include civil rights in the Democratic Party platform, which really makes an impact for African American voters. Because what you have now happening, um, what you have in that moment, is African Americans being able to say, I can associate myself with the Democratic Party because Southern Democrats have formed their own party. So that's really important. But it does say, it says something fascinating about the Republican Party at the time, too, in that there was just a stubbornness around dealing with, or, or perhaps just you, you could say it's an ideological loyalty to a certain economic attitude, because they weren't the party that had people advocating, for the most part, segregation or enforcing segregation in the South. They were, for the most part, the party a, a party of, uh, of, of folks who just had a specific view of economics that just didn't align with getting people jobs. The interesting thing about this, though, is that even as, um, even as the Republican Party is really wrestling with this um, individualism and fiscal conservatism, right, which are still hallmarks of the Republican Party today, they're also wrestling with this issue of race. Um, even as far back as 1932, 1936, they're saying, well, yes, we can include civil rights in our party platform, but we also don't want to alienate white voters. So will civil rights alienate white voters? And they, they kind of go out on a limb and try and appeal to both white voters and African Americans, but then begin increasingly pulling back in some respects um, uh, for African American voters, fearing that they've lost them forever. And now, Katha Pollitt on Pro. The dialogue around abortion is a lot around when does life begin? But it seems like for the vast majority of people, that's really not what they're thinking about when they're thinking about whether they're, uh, whether they're willing to vote in such and such way around abortion. Well, I think what's happened is that abortion has become tied in with uh, right-wing conservatism and it's attached, to, and with religion, of course, and it's all attached to the Republican Party now. So the Republican Party has to placate these people to get them to vote for them. 
Um, and the Republican base, which we see in many issues like immigration, for example, um, separation of church and state, guns, all this, uh, they are very uh, intransigent. They're very um, determined. For example, uh, in this 20-week abortion ban that was, in this, that was pulled from Congress because it was just too um, narrow in the way it defined rape victims, um, the anti-abortion people are furious about that. You know, they don't think, well, okay, you know, yeah, we should define rape in a way that better reflects the actual amount of rape that there is. They think, this is, they've betrayed us, we voted for them, and now they're doing this to us. You know, we're not just here for the taking. Um, you'll see in the next election, these people are extremely um, dedicated and uncompromising. Which you can understand, because if you really do think that life begins at conception or life begins at fetal heartbeat or you know uh -huh. pick your pick your milestone then it, it does make sense to be so fiercely opposed to it right sure they should be as fiercely opposed as they want but that doesn't mean that that this very small number of very committed people should be able to you know wag the dog of America um, because this is an issue where people will always disagree, but public policy has to be made around what's good for everybody. And there's also what you characterize as a problem with how we, we talk about abortion in the first place, that even if you're going to say, you know, I think abortion should be uh, available and legal, but then there's also that, that famous book, Clinton, like, it should also be rare. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a common feature, and, and this kind of agony over abortion in America that you think is what, misplaced? Um, I do think it's misplaced. It, in my book, I try a little bit to sort of reframe the whole issue um, to say, you know, what kind of a society do we want to live in? We want to live in a society where women get to be all they can be, to realize their hopes and dreams, where children are born, when their parents are well positioned to take care of them. Um, and it really, abortion rights is good for everyone. The point isn't how many abortions there are. The point is that children are born in a good, you know, in a, at a time when it's good for their parents. That's all for this week's episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can also listen to an audio-only version of this program as a podcast available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player. The Jewish Channel is available on cable, Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on Cable Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.